Thank you, Lord, for the call to assembly. Hallelujah. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Come on in from the foyer and turn around, greet your neighbor, welcome them to Tree of Life this morning in the name of our God today. service a little differently. Today we have a number of things that need prayer. On the way down today, TJ and Lynn were in a massive car accident a few minutes ago. They walked away, praise God. They come from Mount Laguna every week here, and that's a long drive, and uh, we want to lift them healing, the, the healing up right now for them, God, whatever has happened. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God who heals. So we lift up TJ and Lynn to you right now. Lord, lift up Craig to you, who's ill at home this morning, woke up ill. And many others as well, Lord, that can't be here today for various reasons, God. We just do lift them up to you right now. Lord, as we continue to pray for our own community, we lift up the community of Israel. Yesterday, all Israelis were contacted by phone to have their bags ready by the door to be called to their army posts, reserve duty. Their young children's bags in these homes are also ready to go to grandparents in a different town in the land if the parents are called up this weekend. If Iran attacks them, there will be no electricity, there could be no water, food, and rockets can strike anywhere in Israel, not just from the north. Hezbollah has been firing rockets every day, as you know, into northern Israel. Terrorists are coming in from Jordan in the east. The Houthis are striking from the south. You heard about this morning, earlier, that in the Straits of Hormuz, a ship was commandeered by Iran. Gaza war is continuing happening in the West, so we need to ramp up our prayers over the next 24 hours for Israel. We thank you, Lord, that the prophets tell us in Isaiah chapter 54 that in righteousness you will be established, you will be far from oppression, for you will not fear, and from terror it will not come near you. Behold, anyone fiercely attacking is not from me. Whoever stirs up strife with you will fall because of you. Behold, I created the smith who blows the fire of coals and produces a weapon for its work. And I created the destroyer to ruin. No weapon formed against you will prosper. And you will condemn every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of Adonai's servants. Their vindication is from me. It is a declaration of the Lord. Father, many of us have family. I have family in Israel. We're very uh, tied into what's going on in the land. We recognize potentially, Lord, that we're in a time of Psalm 83 as we see all the nations gathered around Israel. We pray, Lord, for President Biden and his cabinet that they would stand behind Israel. Lord, I am not a conspiracy theorist, but when we see the Francis Scott Key Bridge, when we see the Statue of Liberty being hit by lightning, when we see a lot of these things that have been happening over the last number of weeks, Lord, I believe you're saying to this country, don't turn your back on my people, Israel. So we pray, God, for our government that we would not be deceived in this hour. Lord, we know you love our Arab half-brothers. You desire them to come out of the yoke of Islam, to recognize the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the Messiah, Yeshua. So, Lord, we know that the prophecies tell us that there will be Egypt and Israel and Syria as a three-part salvation. 
And so, God, we know that you're going to release the blindness off those in the Middle East who would attempt to do damage. They're being deceived by Hasatan, the adversary. And so we thank you for these passages like in Isaiah 54, that no weapon forged against Israel would prosper, no biological weapon, no nuclear, no atomic weapon, no ballistic missile would prosper in the land. I thank you for raising up the Iron Dome technology and for those 18-year-old girls who are at the, on their screens pushing buttons to intercept missiles. Keep them alert, God, even at this time. So we thank you, Lord, that our prayers are effective. There's no distance in the spirit necessarily and that what we are praying now, Lord, that you are hearing. You desire your people to pray. And so I thank you, Lord, that as you heal up this community here, that we can be a blessing over there as well. We love you and praise you, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Well, the Matovu was one of these prayers in the Bible, in the book of Numbers and in different Psalms, starting with a prophet sent by Balak, the king of Moab, to do exactly what we've been praying against, to curse the tribes of Israel. And the Bible says, when Balaam saw the people of Israel in their tents, dwelling in peace and safety, that God changed his intention of cursing them. And out of his mouth, he blessed the people of Israel with these beautiful words of praise. Let's recite them back to the Lord today. Ma tovu o halecha yakov mishkenotecha Israel. Oh, how goodly are your tents, O Jacob! Your dwelling places, O Israel. Lord, we love your house and your honor's dwelling place. And we ask you, Lord, would you answer each and every one of us here today with Yeshua, with your true and only salvation. We count on it every day, O God, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, we want to bless our children this morning. If we have any kids in the house, come on up. We want to bless you before you head on off to Shabbat school today. All right, amen. Rich, if you'd help us out here. And Cody, thank you. This is a tradition among our people. And over the girls... We say Yisimech Elohim, Ke Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Valea. May God make each one of you girls like Sarah and Rebecca, Rachel and Leah, the blessed mothers of our people. And for the boys, Yisimcha Elohim, Ke Ephraim, Vechi Menashe. May God make you boys like Ephraim and Manasseh as you build up Israel in your generation. Lord, I thank you for this generation. I thank you that we have Shabbat school teachers and volunteers serving with them that have been praying for them all week, each week, that when they arrive here, Lord, that you've got something special for each one of them this morning as they worship alongside us and get trained in their own classes. Be with our volunteers and be with our kids today in Yeshua's name. Amen. Kids, love you guys. Thanks for being here. Praise the Lord. Well, let's worship our God today in song and dance. Oh, God, oh, I do. 
I couldn't earn it. I 
going to be shaken. A nitzachon shel ha'adon. The victory is the Lord's. We co-labor with God in a battle of spiritual warfare. The devil has been bested. Hasatan has been defeated. But we have to get a little uppity in the spirit at times. Father, take your hands off of God's property here in this place today. We bind cancer. We bind the adversary in every single life. Take your hands off of our finances. Take your hands off of our marriages. Take your hands off of our families. You are defeated. By His stripes, we have been healed. We call the resurrection power of the Messiah in and through our lives. In the life of Robert Marcor, in the life of Aida Baez, in the life of TJ and Lynn, in the life of everyone here. We thank you, Lord, for your health, your Adonai Rofecha. Lord, we lift up Cody's father right now. He will not have to go through open heart surgery. Father, you are giving him a lev chadash, a new heart today, oh God. We thank you, Lord God, that Yeshua bested the devil. We hate the devil. We hate his mission. Yeshua's mission was to bring life and to bring it more abundantly. I don't know about you, but I love to win. We may lose a little skirmish every now and then, but the victory is the Lord's. God sent his very best himself, his son, to best the devil at Golgotha. It was legal according to Torah. And I'm telling you folks, the days are declaring that we cannot play business as usual anymore. When we pray for Israel, there's no distance in the spirit. God hears these prayers. The remnants are rising in the land. Satan hates it because it puts his reputation, on God's reputation on the line because God said all Israel shall be saved. And so, God, I thank you that we can be involved in the battle. We can rejoice in the victories. But, God, today we take authority for what you have called tree of life. That no weapon forged against tree of life and its members would prosper today. We thank you, O God, that you greater is he that's within us than he that's within this world. Lord, the world's spewing out a lot of negative stuff, and we just turn that channel off. We lock into the truth, the way, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through you, Yeshua said. So, Lord, we're not playing Messianic synagogue here. We are playing for keeps, for the salvation of our people here in San Diego and around the country and around this world. Thank you, Lord, that your plan A has still been in effect, that Jew and Gentile would be one in Yeshua, one in the olive tree, multinationally, blessing a world with salt and light that needs to know you, otherwise they're going off into Gehenna. And so we thank you, Lord, that we're on mission every single day. Thank you for breath in our lungs today, as the day is called today. Lord, I thank you for breath in our lungs that we can praise you and worship you this day. Hashem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God is good all the time. Praise God. Ruch Hashem. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward this morning. Thank you, team, so much. Continue playing. It's fine. You have an offering envelope on your seat. You can scan to give the QR code there if you'd like. You can put a check or cash in there. We just ask that you would do it with a joyful heart. Put your wallet back in your pocket if you can't do that. I'm serious. God provides for us. Let's go before the Lord in our giving. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. You can get an annual giving statement from us if you'd like for your taxes. Tax day is only two days away. I hope you've done your taxes. But I think you got a couple extra months in San Diego to do that this year. Alvino Malkeno, our Father and our King, we thank you, Lord, for blessing us 
in our businesses and our employment. Thank you that we can be a light on our job to Yeshua's goodness and his salvific work in our lives. Lord, I thank you that every bill has been paid here at Tree of Life and we've been blessed. Not because we're anything special, because you motivate the hearts of people to give because they want to be a part of your end times plan among the Jewish people and, and the nations. So we thank you for that, the collaboration, Lord. We, we give back to you, Lord, with a joyful and expectant heart today. Hashem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. If this is your first time, I want to welcome you here this morning, especially, and put up your hand. I want to put a free book into that hand. It'll give you a great primer this morning on the Messianic Jewish a revival movement. It's a great uh, read, an easy read, not deep theologically so much, but it'll, it'll get you, give you a vision for why we do what we do here. We continue to lift up those who are held hostage in Gaza this morning. I think it was no accident that on the 1st of Nisan, the biblical new year, Hamas came out and said that there are less than 70 hostages still alive. They've executed, brutally raped, the rest of them. But we continue to pray for those to come out, to move upon the leaders of Israel with Solomonic wisdom as to how to do that. We pray for the IDF soldiers, even right now, Lord, as they are rooting out those four remaining battalions in Rafah as they plan to go back in there and do that. We pray for world opinion, God, that we're not turn against Israel. We find a spirit of anti-Semitism in the world today. We release the love of the Lord in the land of Israel. With that, I'm going to ask Robertson Darcy to come forward with a couple of announcements as we move forward uh, into this coming week. If you'd welcome her, thank you so much. Thank you, baby. All right. Shabbat ah, Shabbat Shalom. This morning. If anyone still has one of those little baby bottles, Ann Lilleberg's in the back, and you can just give it to her anytime. This Tuesday night, we have Torah teaching from Elder Earl, who just walked in the back, and Congregational Prayer to Fila, and it's from 7 to 8.15 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. This teaching series from Earl is based on the book, An Alternate Reality see from heaven's perspective and manifest heaven on earth it's really mind-boggling it's it's crazy good <clears throat> i think we have one more week you can still come and then do you want... following the worship service today there will be an oneg reception for Eric and Karen Bircher. There they are. <laughs> we're so glad you're here, Eric. I didn't realize when I shook your hand when I came in who you were. Nice to meet you. Yay, we're so glad. It's going to be a good time. Yay? Yay. We will have a special guest speaker next Shabbat morning, April 20th. And it's Joshua Turnell, the director of Jews for Jesus in France and Switzerland. His Paris office is often the target of anti-Semitic threats. We got to know Joshua this past May, last year, when we were in Paris for our annual IAMCS conference. He's an amazing speaker. He will have a word for us on that Shabbat, which is Shabbat Haggadol, right before the onset of Passover. We are so looking forward to what the Lord has put on his heart for us. Tickets for our community Passover Seder that is on April 27th at noon. And what, that's two weeks from today? It will be at the Legacy International Center. Those tickets are available for purchase at www.mcwe.com or the link in the congregational app. It's in the main Tree of Life group message thread from March 25th. And it's via the Legacy's Eventbrite system. So please don't come to Rabbi or myself or Kat or anyone else saying, how can I get my tickets? I need to buy a ticket from you. Because we're not selling them. It's through the Eventbrite system, through Legacy. This event will sell. 
lovely. This event will sell out as it did last year, as many legacy attendees that are at their Passover conference will also be purchasing tickets. So please don't wait. They are first come, first serve tickets. So because we will be at the legacy, there will be no worship service here on that morning because we will be there preparing for the Seder at noon. Our Yom HaShoah Holocaust Remembrance Day worship service will take place on Shabbat morning, May 4th. I will be in Seattle that weekend ministering at a women's retreat that is sponsored by Beit Tikva Messianic Synagogue. And Beit Tikva, the um, current congregational leader, his name is Joey Suyat, and when he was 12, he used to come to our congregation with his dad and mom, and his dad was in the Navy. Anyway, it's amazing to see that, and I'm so excited to go there. And so I think they're our sister congregation. They're great people. Anyway, I would appreciate prayer for my preparations for what I am to share at that retreat with these ladies. So thank you so much for holding me up in prayer. And last but not least, Rabbi Joel and I will be working and ministering at an annual IMCS conference in Amsterdam, Netherlands, the weekend of May 17th and 18th. Elder Judge Earl will be bringing the message that Shabbat right here. Thank you so much. Shabbat Shalom. Praise the Lord. This is Salt and Light Shabbat. I'd like to call up Jill and Bernie Spriggs, if you'd welcome them for our monthly Bema announcements. What do you have for us? You getting the better half? Oh, we get the better half, yeah. just decorative today. So. Okay, so the couple things you guys should know about, be praying about, and writing postcards about. California State Issue, Bill aims to combat child trafficking. All of us feel pretty strongly about that, it's not a question. Senator Shannon Grove introduced bipartisan Senate Bill 1414, SB 1414, to combat child trafficking. It includes felony charge regardless of the buyer's awareness of the minor's age. Read the April newsletter to see how SB 1414 closed loopholes in the existing laws. I'm going to read a little bit more, a little bit more about that. Um, we stressed the necessity of prosecuting those who pay for such crimes, um, stating anyone who commits a brutal crime against children prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. Yeah. And the second one, do you need to be aware of, praying about, and writing postcard about? Come up to our tables and we've got postcards with the stamps. And we'll mail them for you. And the second one is a national issue. This one I have found very complicated because my brain kind of can't wrap around it. But it's the Intel Chair Defends TikTok Bill. You all know about TikTok. Okay, the House Intelligence Chairman Mike Turner defended a bill aimed at potentially banning video hosted service TikTok in the US due to national security concerns regarding Chinese ownership. You can read the April newsletter to see the challenges and the risks involved. We have copies of these newsletters to give you more details, more links, and I would encourage you to stop by. We have a TikToker in our midst. Cody Hug is on TikTok, putting out great material multiple times per week, short videos. And so just for the sake of Cody, we don't want to see TikTok go. We understand the issues, but Cody, I uh, hope you have a backup plan, my brother. Move it to YouTube. All right. I joke as we get to this portion of scripture that if anyone in the room has insomnia, that this passage of scripture that we're going to look at today will be the cure for you. Challenge accepted. All right. I will not blame you if you fall asleep during this message, but my encouragement to you is to go home and read Leviticus chapters 12 and 13 
when God gets you up at 2 in the morning after you've dealt with God and whatever He woke you up for to get back to sleep. So, with that said, Parsha Tazria, Tazria today, she conceived, as we've seen since October in our study, as we journey through the Torah, we read, we read once again in last Shabbat's parasha, the Torah frequently is speaking about clean and unclean, the states of being clean and unclean. According to the Torah, it is possible for a person to be ritually clean or tahor or ritually unclean, tameh. But what does it mean to be one or the other of those? Well, being ritually clean means that a person is physically fit to enter the sanctuary, to participate in the sanctuary worship services, to eat of the sacrifices. A ritually unclean person cannot participate in the mishkan, the tabernacle, or the temple, or, or handle holy things such as the sacrifices. A ritually unclean person can attain, though, ritual purity by only through uh, purification rituals prescribed by the Torah. After purification, the person then can enter the sanctuary and eat of the sacrifices. And so we as Western Scripture readers, we commonly, though, mistake ritual uncleanness as some kind and indication of moral deficiency or spiritual unworthiness. It is not. Ritual uncleanness is a normal human condition that everyone experiences every single day as we live without the tabernacle as we live without the temple, as we live without a sacrifice. Yet concerns about, quote-unquote, clean or unclean have seemingly little relevance for our lives today. But in the days when Adonai's sanctuary stood in the midst of Israel, people paid very careful attention to their ritual state. Let's begin to unpack that issue as we summarize and extrapolate the text in this parasha. Leviticus chapter 12. And we begin with the impurity that it talks about in this chapter after childbirth. Parashah Tazria, she conceived. In Leviticus chapter 12, the text turns to the office of parent. Many of us in this room have experienced the blessing of parenthood from God. It can be one of life's greatest joys. Amen. At the same time, as a new mother becomes a parent, the physical waste that was part of childhood, however, had to be treated as tumah, an impurity, often translated as contamination, often translated as defilement, often translated as pollution or uncleanness. Tumah, the causes of tumah are human corpses, carcasses of animals, fluxes of life fluids, and a specific condition known as sara'at, which we're going to look at in the next chapter. How many of you have already fallen asleep? The common denominator is that these are all manifestations of mavet, of death. These three elements actually affect the disposal of impurity. Number one, the passage of time. Number two, cleansing, which often occurred in water and the purification offering. The first two would purify the individual. The third one purges the sanctuary. And so chapter 12 covers the laws that relate to impurities contracted by a woman through this process of giving birth. A woman is ritually impure for seven days after giving birth to a male and 14 days for a female. Now, after that initial period of uncleanness, the new mother remains separated for 33 more days for a male child, or 66 more days for a female child, and then she's clean. Now, modern medicine recognizes no difference between the postpartum genital flow of the mother of a boy and that of a mother of a girl. However, those here in the ancient Near East may have believed there was a difference in that a daughter often had a slight vaginal discharge at birth, making both mother and daughter unclean, requiring a longer time for purification. Aren't these just great scriptures to be talking about this morning? The observable discharge of heavy dark fluid, which lasts for a number of days, 
followed by a lighter flow may last for a number of weeks. That provides the explanation of the two phases of her purification as well. Now, an obvious question gets raised as we read through Leviticus chapter 12, and that is, why is a woman rendered ritually unclean by the event of childbearing? Well, the flow of blood which follows birth, especially the placenta, reminds one of the shedding of blood and thus is symbolic of death, similar to the little death of menstruation, it seems clear in this passage. In addition, other bodily emissions and secretions were considered unclean and made the woman unprepared to enter the pure surroundings of the Mishkan, the tabernacle. Again, the state of being unclean did not mean sinful. Notice here in verse 6 of chapter 12 that the passage of time brought cleansing so that the woman was now able to bring offerings to the tabernacle to mark the completion of her purification. My friends, I think that you and I can find a connection in this chapter to the birth of the Messiah. The Gospel of Luke wanted to show his readers that Yeshua's parents did everything in accordance with the Torah. Luke showed how Joseph and Miriam observed the commandments of this chapter, circumcising Yeshua on the eighth day, bringing the prescribed sacrifice after the days of their purification were completed. So let's continue on in the parasha concerning a different aspect of impurity, and that is impurity caused by tzara'at. Chapter 13 deals with preliminary symptoms of skin diseases. Again, if you want to get some good sleep, read chapter 13. It's not the most exciting narrative in the Bible, but we open the number, the first eight verses of chapter 13 deals with preliminary symptoms of skin diseases. And then it goes on with symptoms of raw flesh and it talks about boils and it talks about burns and it talks about sores on the head and the chin, white spots and skin diseases on the head that cause baldness. Directions are given in this chapter. They're provided in order to determine whether these skin diseases are present or not. And so if a conclusive diagnosis can't be made, seven-day waiting periods then ensue, after which the condition is re-examined again. So let's begin. Let's pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 13. Then Adonai spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, When a man has a swelling on the skin of his body, or a scab, or a bright spot, and it becomes the plague mark of tzara'at in his flesh, then he shall be brought to Aaron, the Kohen, the priest, or to one of his sons, the Kohanim. The Kohen is to examine the plague of Tzara'at on his skin, and if the hair in the plague has turned white, and the appearance of the plague is deeper than the body's skin, it is the plague of Tzara'at. Now the Hebrew term here employed in this Torah section is Tzara'at. The Septuagint regularly translates it with the Greek term lepra, which was until the ninth century of this era described as a skin disease which looked, looks like scales. And so when we read leprosy in our English Bibles, we should most likely understand it to mean psoriasis, eczema, fungal infections, portions of skin losing pigment, and perhaps even skin cancer. The use of the term in the original languages as surface infections and textiles and building materials suggest an even broader range for the word, probably designating some type of mold or mildew that can affect both cloth and plaster as well. Now, doctors state that the disease that we today call leprosy generally begins with pain in certain areas of the body, followed by numbness. And soon the skin in such spots begins to lose its original color. It gets to be thick, glossy, and scaly. Aren't these wonderful scriptures to be talking about this morning? The affliction is called leprosy because it makes the skin scaly. Again, the Greek word lepos, meaning scale. And as this sickness begins to progress, the thickened spots become dirty sores and ulcers due to poor blood supply. The skin, especially around the eyes and the ears, begin to bunch up. The skin does with deep furrows between the swellings. Fingers drop off. Fingers get absorbed. 
Toes are affected similarly. Eyebrows and eyelashes drop off. The disease can rapidly turn into a terminal illness. Now, one tragic symptom of tsara'at is that it actually deadens out the nerve endings. That's not good. Why? You touch a hot stove, your nerve endings send a quick panic message to your brain. Remove those fingers. But lepers run the risk of having their fingers and toes crushed or burned because the nerve endings are not sending the warning signals to the brain if there's pain present. One of the worst characteristics, though, of tsara'at is that an affected a person eventually becomes disfigured. Within a matter of weeks, the person is unrecognizable because of the tsara'at. The word means, tsara'at means to rot. Many experts relate that a person is in the advanced stages of this disease looks more like a wild animal than a person. Now, modern medicine today cannot match the descriptions in this portion of Scripture with any known disease of modern times, primarily because skin disorders today cannot be identified and quarantined in the short period of time that's prescribed biblically, seven days, two weeks, etc. And furthermore, the skin disorders which might fit, those are not today not found on woven material. They're not found on leather. They're not found on non-living substances either, which the Bible records. Again, skin diseases most likely produce impurity because they're, they're viewed as bringing death to certain parts of the body, to the skin, to the scalp, etc. Everything you never wanted to know about Sarah today. All right. These impurities can be contracted by being under the same roof, whereas other impurities are only contracted by actually touching someone. This is why the one who's diagnosed with sara'at must, in verse 46, dwell apart, to live outside the camp, the area around the tabernacle and around the courtyard when Israel lived in tents. That was to be cut off from the blessings of the covenant. So you see, God was present in a special way, not only in the tabernacle, but in the camp around it as well. And so it's understandable that a person diagnosed as unclean would, in verse 45 of this chapter, would be in mourning, would go into mourning. My friends, such diseases, however diverse they are, threatened the holiness, the holiness of the camp of Israel. Therefore, the priests were responsible to examine the one who showed any signs of tzara'at and declare him either afflicted or well. But the Kohen's not a physician. They have no role in the healing process. In cases where the unclean nature of this infection is not increasingly immediately apparent, the priest would then quarantine that person for seven days and then inspect the infection again after that. To be declared clean, the marks would have to not spread and to have visibly healed over the course of 14 days of quarantine. Maybe we can relate a little bit back to 2020 when a lot of us were quarantined. If the condition worsened upon reinspection by the priest, then the person was pronounced unclean. The specific criteria used to diagnose the condition varied, but they generally included the, the different color, color of the skin in the diseased area, as we see here, the color of the hair in the diseased area, and the size of the infected area. Now, the fate of the one whom the priest pronounced impure was very grave. The Torah treats the leper as a man who has already died. You see, in some ways, all human beings are like lepers. Though we're still alive, we dwell in mortal bodies that are dying. And on a spiritual level, our mortal bodies are afflicted with a leprous condition called sin. Sin corrupts our flesh. And until our Messiah cleanses us from sinful passions, those passions are, quote, at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death, Romans 7, 5. They spread death through the flesh, just as leprosy spreads across the skin. We must find a cure, my friends, for this spiritual malady before the day of our examination. And so the leper was banned from the camp. The leper was assigned the clothing of a mourner. He was required to announce 
his own uncleanness. Wherever he went, he had to cry out, Tame, Tame, unclean, unclean. Verse 45, so that no one would involuntarily be polluted. And even if a leper thought that he had become free of his disease, he was not to rejoin his people, the people, until a priest came to him outside of the camp. Chapter 14 next week tells us to examine him and declare him clean. Now, interestingly enough, and you can put this into your hopper of exegesis and pray about it. Interestingly enough, the ancient commentators tended to see Tzara'at as a direct punishment for the sin of Lashon Hara. I don't believe this, but this is what commentators will tell you, speaking evil of other people. And they say this because they derive it from the punishment of Tzara'at that was given to Miriam, that was given to Moses' sister, who spoke against her brother, who gossiped about her brother, the leader of the Hebrews in Numbers chapter 12. In any event, the leper took on the appearance of a mourner because he was to mourn for his sins that had brought him to this state. He remained outside the camp morally as well as physically, suffering not only disease, but disgrace as well. Now, I think we can really make a lot of great application for this. I'm going I'm to use this mic, guys, okay? During the ministry of the Messiah Yeshua, a leper, we remember, violated those rules. In light of the prevailing view of Tzara'at, Yeshua's contemporaries would be shocked that he let this leper draw near to him, and even more, that Yeshua reached out his hand to, 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 to touch him. That Yeshua, then, then Yeshua does something that his contemporaries might understand, but that you and I might find a little weird. Yeshua says to the leper, he says this, quote, Do not tell anyone about this. But, what, go show yourself to the priest and present the offering for your cleansing that Moses required as a testimony to them. My friends, if the Messiah Yeshua cleanses this leper, what need is there for a priest? Well, as we see, the Torah teaches that when one is actually cleansed of leprosy, he is to stand outside the camp until a priest would come to examine him, chapter 14, and declare him clean. But the priest has no authority to cleanse. Only the Messiah possesses that. On another occasion, Yeshua healed ten men, right? With Sarat. But I think we often miss that larger lesson in that passage, in that healing account, which is, I think, what we really need to be focusing on today. Let's look for a few minutes at that rendering. Luke chapter 17. And let's begin picking it up in verse 11. Now, while going up to Jerusalem, Yeshua was passing between Samaria and the Galilee. And as he entered a certain village, ten men with Sara'at came toward him. They stood some distance away and raised their voices, saying, Yeshua, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the Kohanim. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell at Yeshua's feet face down, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Then Yeshua answered and said, weren't ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Weren't any found who came back to give glory to God except this foreigner? Then Yeshua said to the man, stand up and go. Your emunah, your faith, your trust has made you well. Let me ask us a question this morning. How many of us have ever had a lousy day? We all have. The scriptures never promise us that our lives are going to be free from pain and tribulation and difficulties. Instead, they promise us that we will have many trials and tribulations in this life. But the secret to a successful life is knowing where to turn for help when we have a problem. That's the lesson that we learn from one of these men 
who had sara'at. And this lesson has several components to it that cause us to learn about ourselves. Number one, we have a deadly problem that only Yeshua can fix. It was common for Jewish Galileans to travel through Samaria on their way to Judea, on their way to Jerusalem. This incident happened somewhere close to the border between southern Galilee and northern Samaria. And this accounts, this is the reason why there's Jewish and Samaritan lepers in one group. Their common affliction had brought them together. And one of the most tragic things about Sara'at was that the infected persons were not allowed to even be with their families. Ooh, isn't that interesting? That happened a little bit a few years ago with some of us. Lepers were forcibly separated and denied contact with those that they loved. They were thrown out of their homes and towns and had to live by themselves. Thus, often lepers would congregate and live together. But listen, blindness was another common symptom of tzara'at that increased this helpless feeling of isolation. You see, because lepers cannot feel with their hands, they're not able to function like other blind people. The disease caused them to have a terrible sense of isolation. They felt alone. They felt rejected. They felt despised and hopeless. Now, even though none of us has sara'at, we're all born with a deadly disease the Scriptures call terminal sin. It causes us to be spiritual outcasts. My friends, you and I may feel strong and healthy today at Tree of Life, but if we don't have a personal relationship with Yeshua, there is a terrible, insidious, invisible cancer growing inside of our souls. No MRI will pick it up. No CAT scan will pick it up. No other diagnostic tool can find it, but God's Word says it's there. What are we going to do about it? We're to do the same thing that these ten men did. Number two, they admitted their need. We have to admit our need and cry out to Yeshua. These ten men banded together. They decided, we're not going to give, we're not going to die, we're not going to give up. What they do? They got up and they headed toward Yeshua. They said, we've got a big problem, Adon, Master. We're going to die. We need to get some help, my friends. Before Yeshua can help us, we must quit fooling ourselves. We must admit we have a problem, but that's not enough. We have to cry out to Yeshua. The next component is that God's power is not released until we step out in ebuna, in trust, in faith. Now, the lepers here probably did not expect the Messiah to respond as he did. He didn't lay hands on them. He didn't pronounce them clean by doing that. He simply said what? Go and show yourselves to the priests. As we see, Leviticus 13 has some very detailed (laughs) regulations about how a Jewish priest could declare a person clean or unclean. These ten men, they knew they were unclean. They had already been declared lepers. Yeshua brings them here to a crisis of faith as his command implied by the time they reached the priest, they would have experienced the prerequisite healing for presentation to the priests. Now, the lepers had a choice, right? They could have refused to go. They could have said, Yeshua, repeat that request. You see, Yeshua's testing them here. He's testing their faith, right? He's testing their obedience. If they really regarded Yeshua as their master and Lord, they would obey him. So the lepers decide, yep, we're going to obey, and ten of them head off to see the priests. Listen, And as they went, they were healed. My friends, there is a powerful lesson about trust right here. It wasn't until when they stepped out in trust and obeyed Yeshua that they experienced His healing power. That's the way faith works, my friends. Faith is trusting and obeying Adonai, even if we don't have any visible, physical evidence supporting our decision. 
Faith is walking on the Word of God. Faith doesn't need any evidence. It simply obeys. Faith is coming to the edge of all that we can see, all that we can feel, taking one more step into the darkness, trusting that God, that He's either going to catch us or that He's going to teach us to fly. One of the two. The next component of the lesson for us, I think, today is time is never wasted by being at the feet of Yeshua. On the way to the priests, the lepers began to look at one another and suddenly they realized, hey, we're healed. And at that point, we don't know what happened to 90% of this group. Perhaps they journeyed to show themselves to the priests or maybe they ran back to their families. We don't know. But we know from Yeshua's response that one of them did the right thing. This guy was not content just to go to the priest. He turned back. He ran back to Yeshua. He fell at his feet to give him thanks, loudly giving God glory. The fact that, quote, he was a Samaritan rather than a Jew is very noteworthy, I think. The Jewish people had more knowledge about the Messiah and his coming than foreigners. The Jewish former lepers should have recognized who Yeshua was and expressed their gratitude as well. Here's the key lesson. Ten men were exposed to God's power, but only one sought a personal relationship with him. Nine of the men were content to receive the blessing of God, but only one of them cared enough to return to the source of the blessing, to worship God. In that vein, have you found, have I found, that we only come to God with our shopping lists? Or maybe we use God like a heavenly 911 call. My friends, God loves you and wants you to spend time with Him. He desires for you to worship and fellowship with Him. The next component to this lesson, I believe, is that a relationship with Yeshua makes us a foreigner in this world. You might recall that, a, that the Samaritans were a mixed race of descendants that originated from intermarriage, right? Of the Israelites that were left behind when Israel was conquered and exiled to Assyria in 722 BCE. And if the people, the pagans of other nations who were brought into the land by the Assyrians, they were intermixing, intermarrying, and so on. They formed their own religion. It was a little bit of a concocted mixture of Judaism and paganism. They adopted the five books of Moses as the sole sacred book. Taught them that the Messiah was no greater than Moses. And when our Jewish people returned back to the homeland many years later, they rejected their help, the Samaritans' help, in rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple. And the breach became then permanent at that point, continuing on in history. To the day when the Jewish king John Hyrcanus destroyed the Samaritan temple in the 2nd century B.C. Again, Yeshua pointed out that one man who returned was a Samaritan. A foreigner. He acted differently than 90% of the other lepers. My friends, those of us who have entered into a relationship with Yeshua. We don't act and we don't think like other people. Have you not noticed? We're always in the minority about the way that we act and the way that we think. We never quite fully feel at home in this earth, in this world. And by the way, we probably shouldn't. Just as this one man, a foreigner, acted differently from the crowd, that's us. We're to do the same thing. The final component is this. We need to let Yeshua finish what he started in us. Look again at these final words to the man from Yeshua in verse 19. He said, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Concentrate on that last word. Well, it means to be complete. It means to be whole. Yeshua did not come to this earth to solely heal people of diseases. Otherwise, he would have established a hospital. He came to this world to seek and to spiritually save the lost. He came to make people whole. 
nothing missing, nothing broken. That's shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Here's the result of this miracle. Ten men were cleansed, but only one man became whole. My friends, Yeshua wants to do more than just clean you up and heal you. He wants to make you whole. He wants to make you complete. He wants to give you this free, His free gift of eternal salvation. Amen. Yeshua's solution is to be merciful, to forgive, and to welcome back warmly and quickly. That's the kind of God we serve, ladies and gentlemen. Perhaps you need to come to God today. Maybe you're listening on YouTube or one of the podcasts and you recognize you can't truly live without His mercy and forgiveness. You want to be part of, of God's redeemed family. How do we do that? Well, simply, it's like when we began our academic journey as a little kid. We learned our ABCs, right? And likewise, there are the ABCs of this messianic journey. A, we admit. A, admit. We admit we've not lived a perfect life. And in fact, we've committed crimes in the sight of God. Sin. We're in need of a Messiah. Admitting our sin involves the concept of confession. To agree with in the Greek. We have to agree with God that we haven't measured up His standard, His perfect standard of sinlessness. That's the A of the ABCs in this Messianic journey. And then we move to B, which is believe. We have to believe that Yeshua is the only Messiah available. The Scriptures say that salvation is found in no one else. No one else. If you need a Messiah today from your sinfulness, you have only one choice, and that choice is Yeshua. And C, the final C of the ABCs in this messianic journey is to choose. We have to choose to follow Yeshua as the Messiah, to place our faith in Him alone. Repentance, teshuva, metanoia in the Greek. Repentance requires that we make a conscious choice. We actually change our mind about the way we're going to live the rest of our lives. It means we got to get off the throne of our lives and let Yeshua sit there instead. So, it's a pretty simple ABC process, folks. If you've admitted your sinfulness and you believe that Yeshua is the only option that, you can really get, get, that can really save you and you want to take care of the sin problem in your life, if you want to be delivered from the bondage of sin in your life, but if you've not yet chosen to place your faith in Yeshua the Messiah, I'd invite you, if you're here in the house or listening otherwise, to do a prayer, something like this with me. Adonai, thank you for loving me so much, God, that you sent your only son to die on the tree of sacrifice to pay in full for all of my sins. Lord, I'm sorry I've gone my own way for so long. I confess to you that I've sinned against a holy God. I admit I need a Messiah because I've got a sin problem. I need that cure. I believe that heaven and I believe that abundant life here and now are gifts that you can give me. Gifts that I can't earn. Gifts that I don't deserve. Help me to be the individual you created me to be as I choose to follow you the rest of my life. As we look back in our portion today in Leviticus 13, these laws of uncleanness constantly are reminding the people of the devastating results of their sins. But I think as we read this chapter as well, we see these laws also show something else. They show Adonai's care for the people. Why? Well, for example, because our people were living so closely together with one another and that we were wandering from place to place, infectious skin diseases or environmental hazards could cause widespread death and destruction to many other groups of people. That's why these unclean things had to be contained. That's why these unclean things had to be controlled. And so we pick it up in verse 46 at the end of the portion. All the days during which the plague is on him, he will be unclean. He is unclean. He is to dwell alone. Outside of the camp will be his dwelling. Why? Because, my friends, God's camp, his sanctuary, represents immortality and incorruptibility. In his presence, by the way, there's no decay. In his presence... There's no death. There's no decomposition. And therefore, he has to ban from his sanctuary the disease that represents just that, a living decomposition. Yet, Yeshua provides the solution to the leprosy problem. Spiritually, he did not suffer leprosy-like infection 
of sin. Physically, Yeshua's flesh did not suffer corruption. Through His resurrection from the dead, His flesh passed from the mortal to the immortal, from the corruptible to the incorruptible. His resurrected body remains real human flesh, regenerated into an imperishable spiritual body. Therefore, He is the perfect, eternal Kohen, able to serve in the incorruptible sanctuary. As we read the final verses, we're not going to read them, but as you read through verses 47 to 59 in this chapter, these verses discuss sarahat visible in textiles, in leather. A greenish or reddish color was indicative of sarahat in these things, and that was considered analogous to disease on the human skin. Now, as you know, many of you have been to Israel during the rainy season between October through March. This is a problem along the coast, especially by the Sea of Galilee, because it's humid, very humid. And so if the problem was still present after a seven-day observation, the item would be burned. Your couch would be burned. If the affected area did not grow larger, your couch would be laundered. Mom, if you'd come up. And so I think, again, just a few final lessons we can learn from this passage in this portion this week. Number one is that disease is usually contagious and therefore, for the good of the whole, the infected person is quarantined. The scriptures have much to say, my friends, about the effects of sin, and that is it is contagious in nature. One becomes stained through close contact with the staining agent. Keeping oneself unstained from the world can only be done, my friends, by keeping our hearts from becoming entangled with the things of this world. Sin, like contagions, spreads through contact. In the spiritual realm, it spreads through the knitting together of lives. Rabbi Saul makes this explicit when he writes this, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Secondly, the priest is the one who judges whether or not we're sick. It's significant because often we are sick and we don't realize that. And we refuse to accept what we know to be true. From a spiritual standpoint... Such a cure can only come through the office of the priest, the work he does in the realm of atonement and reconciliation. Let us never be fooled, my friends, into thinking that somehow we are able to cure ourselves from sin. The only remedy for it is the atoning work of Messiah. We may pretend that we can make ourselves well, and we may even come to convince ourselves that our own cure is effective when we stand, though, one day before the high priest and he looks at the spots upon us. If we've not been made whole by his work, he will pronounce us tame, unclean, contaminated, will be cast out of his presence as one who is unclean. My friends, the deceitfulness of sin is such that the one affected by it doesn't recognize the symptoms of it. That's why we have to listen to one another. That's why we have to be willing to humble ourselves before under the mighty hand of God, allowing our lives to be scrutinized by His Word. Third, not only must we admit we have this sickness, we must admit the only cure available, Adonai's miraculous healing humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God if we're to receive his forgiveness. Here's the point at which our soul is willing now to rest in God, and apart from this rest, there's no healing. And finally, number four, healing produces, like the one leper of the ten, a heart of worship, a heart of thanksgiving. If you'd stand with me this morning, we have not been healed primarily, listen, so that we can be free from the pain of the disease, even though that's wonderful. Let me say that again. We have not been healed primarily so that we can be free from the pain of the disease. 
Yes, our healing brings joy to our lives. It brings shalom to our souls. It brings freedom, thank God, from the pain of the disease and the sickness which dominating sin brings. But we have rather been healed. Why? So that we might be and do what God intended for us from the beginning. And so, the heart that has been healed will inevitably offer, like this one leper, sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. And that's the reason why you and I gather here every single Shabbat, to express our heart's praise, to express our heart's thanksgiving to our healer and our redeemer. We have been reconciled back to the Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Abba, we thank you for this word today. Lord, even in the seemingly, quote-unquote, boring parts of Scripture, it screams out application for our lives. Father, your word is our very manna. It's our very bread. It's the bread of life. Some of us are still saying, man, huh? What is this? It's the word of life. Lord, we do continue to bless you today for those in our lives that will hear this message through here or through our lips, through your lips, our neighbors. I pray for our neighbor, Carrie, who's been such a blessing to us when crazy things have happened in our neighborhood. As we start to get to know her, Lord, begin to just reveal yourself to her in a mighty way. And for those neighbors in your neighborhoods as well, as you continue to intercede, beginning to open your mouth, sharing the good news of Yeshua, the healing mechanism for unclean spiritual conditions. Thank you, Lord, for this one leper who did the right thing. Although a foreigner, not versed in the Holy Scriptures, he did the right thing. And Lord, we're doing the right thing today. We're coming back to you. We've been made whole. We've been made clean. We've been healed. We're not going to our families first. We're coming back to you and we're saying, Abba, Father, thank you. Thank you. And Yeshua says to us, you've been made well. We love you, Lord, and we bless you. And as you told Aaron, told Moses to tell Aaron and the priest, his sons, to bless the people, we likewise do this from the word of God from Numbers chapter 6. Ya era do nai panavelecha vi khuneka Isha do nai panvelecha vi semelecha Shalom May the Lord bless you and keep you this day May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May Adonai lift up his countenance over you and grant you his peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua of Nazareth, and all of us with him, as his people said. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Meet us back out in the lobby. I just want to make a, a, just a quick uh, a blessing over this newly married couple and celebrate with them with some great nosh. Shalom Aleichem.